I wondered for you as an actor what the lure was of, of Scar because it's a, it's a character that many people know and it's a performance that many people know. What was it for you as an actor that you kind of drew in for this? And did you kind of have to, I don't know, detach yourself from the original to bring this new version to life? Well, I mean, the, um, the original is undetachable from, you know, because uh, it, Jeremy Irons just sort of uh, created such an incredible, you know, uh, indelible character, you know, um, with Scar, that uh, even though I didn't immediately sort of go back and look at it, you know, just before sort of doing this one, it's... It, I'm so fam I'm just so familiar with it because I loved the f the original film and and that and his original performance like everybody else basically. Um, so it really was in this case just sort of looking at just what was in the edges of all of that. You know, just what you know with what John Favreau was talking about in terms of uh, a, a really realistic version, a sort of hyper realistic version of it which I couldn't get my head around initially at all, you know, until I really started at the end of the process to see the, the full images. Um, but it was in that idea of realism, I thought, well, maybe there's something to uncover or to think about in terms of Scar and his, his psychological damage and, uh, and, and how, he, uh, how and why he operates in the way that he does and does the despicable things that he does. And maybe there is something, uh, an area to explore in terms of, um, you know, obsessions, you know, with, uh, with, with power and obsessions with status and, um, and those kinds of, you know, um, addictions, really. Um, so that was the, the sort of area that I, that I thought was really exciting to explore. Uh, let me begin by asking you what kind of lured you to, to this one. Obviously, I know you worked with Disney before, but what was it about yes. The Lion King specifically that, that kind of spoke to I, you? I think it was more that I had learned so much on The Jungle Book, and I wanted to see if I could apply what I had learned to this particular story. That's such a legacy with this movie. Did that kind of detract you at all, or was that quite a, a, quite a good challenge in I think in it was a ways? challenge. I mean, it's uh, the upside is so great, because you don't get a story like this or music like this, and the opportunity to reach out to any cast member you wanted, and and for them to be excited at the prospect of being part of re reimagining this for a new generation. And then of course the, the technology was so exciting and, to, and if you could get this right, you could really engage an audience, a worldwide audience in a way that they feel uh, completely emotionally immersed and that those great feelings of the highs and the low and the uplift of the ending, the excitement, the laughter that I experienced seeing the original film, if I could capture that using these tools and techniques, that was, a, that was a really interesting prospect. Well, first of all, absolute pleasure to meet you. Thank you. I've been a huge fan for many, many years. Um, what was it about John's vision that kind of sold you to go back to this? Because I can imagine that you've, you've done it once and maybe there wasn't a challenge for you, but... No, that's what I him? thought. That's what I thought. I thought, you know, I was going, oh, whatever, you know, there was a little bit of, um, you know, ownership involved, but, but John was very smart. All he said to me was, come over, I want to show you something. And he just showed me the opening. And it was like, oh my God, I thought I could imagine, you know, I, 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 I thought I knew and I didn't know. And it moved me, it, 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 you know, as simple as that. I mean, it astonished me, it, it, you know, I thought it was amazing. I was looking at the technology and suddenly I wasn't looking at the technology anymore, I was being moved. And I thought, and, and, and there was a weirdly improvisational quality about the whole thing, you know. And then just talking to John, you know, and once you get past the let's talk about how amazing the technology is and all that stuff, you're talking to somebody who's got a huge big heart and, and who's got enormous respect of, of the work we had done before. So it seemed inevitable that you know, uh, you know, I had to go and do this. I spoke to Tilda Swinton last year about Suspiria, and when the year before, I'd asked her before she was making it, and she said, "Oh, it's not a remake; it's a cover, darling." And I always thought that was that was that was fascinating because she spoke about Shakespeare and how lots of people play Hamlet, lots of people play Judas Caesar, all that kind of stuff. Did that ever? You've done a lot of Shakespeare. Did that kind of feed into your performance in that there was a lot more to discover, even though it was very similar? Oh yeah, I mean, I definitely think that that's exactly the way to. To think about it, you know that it's not um, that you know that that going back and revisiting certain things is is also part of you know telling stories, you know, and finding different ways to tell stories. You know, I don't feel like there's any 
inherent complication with that, you know. And what's funny is there are some things that people, like Les Mis, for example, people are very happy to do that, you know. And there are other things people are, get all complicated about. And there doesn't seem to be any real rationale in terms of like an actually identified psychology of why, you know. Um, you know, why one is better than the other and why that, you know, why there's, why there's complications with certain things. But the real truth is I think that everything can be, if it can absorb it, if it's good enough to absorb it, sh uh, can and should be re-looked at and, uh, and, and reworked or rethought about and, and to see if there, there is anything else, you know, that can, be, uh, that can be come out of it sort of thematically or in this case with themes and also with technology, you know, and, you know, and if, you, and if a story is really beloved, then it's wonderful to be able to give that its fanfare to, uh, to another generation who maybe might have been aware of it and might have really liked it, but never had the kind of spectacle of it that, that, that we all got 25 years ago. I can imagine as well with that, did it kind of open up your imagination even more than you thought with the story? Because you'd seen it once before, and then when you saw the technology, did it kind well, of... Well, no, oh, I, I, tell you, I tell you what did. I tell you what did. So something happened sort of in, in between all this. You know, I mean, I, I never left my studio. I was forever moaning about having stage fright. I can't do this, da da da, da. And Johnny Mount Pharrell sort of beat me up and um, basically said to me, one of these days you have to go out there and look an audience in the eye and do things in real time and stop hiding behind the screen. Um, and one of the things we were offered was doing the Coachella Festival. I was going, oh, this will be cool. The desert, drag an orchestra and a choir out into the desert, that'll be fun. But we're not going to do The Lion King. And Niall Ma, Johnny's 23-year-old son, said, Hans, just get over yourself. It's the soundtrack of my generation. We are doing The Lion King. And we did. And there's 80,000 grown men and women um, feeling genuine emotion, not sentimentality, but you know, it, it, it resonated. It, it, you, you felt it. And you felt, you felt the musicians behind I felt the mus musicians behind me really, really performing it. And I said to John, OK, if we, if we do this, I want to do it like this. I want to do it like a performance, because I don't have to explain to anybody in the orchestra, any of the musicians, why they are playing those notes. They all know. So let's just rehearse, uh, really get it under our fingers, and get all the filmmakers in and do a concert. And in terms of the, the challenge, did you find this more, obviously because of the, the legacy of 25 years in this movie, th was this more of a challenge than, say, doing something like Iron Man from the beginning, or even yeah. Iron Man 2, because that yeah. came obviously with MCU well, stuff Man 2, and everything. Iron Man 2 is more challenging than Iron Man 1. I thought the <laughs> sequel would be easier, but it's harder because everybody's watching you and everybody's uh, giving you input and everybody's trying to incorporate and include things that uh, they felt that the original, you know, that, this, that, that would be... Uh, appropriate for a sequel and building towards Avengers and, and the MCU. So I like the freedom of uh, being the first one involved in establishing a franchise like with Iron Man. Uh, working on The Mandalorian now is really fun because there's no characters that anybody knows. We have invented all new characters and set in the Star Wars world. So there's a lot of freedom there. But the upside of working on something like this is exciting because people already have a an emotional understanding of what that story is, and they have a connection to this material. And the music already exists, and it's wonderful. So uh, to me, there's, a, there's pros and cons to each. But for The Lion King, I felt that it was, uh, if I could deliver it, there would be a lot of people who would be very uh, appreciative because they, they love the story. And I think that they you know, are very concerned that any time this title is remade, and, and with Disney, doing quote-unquote live-action adaptations of their uh, classic animation, um, that, that it would be handled right and with care. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about your career, which I've followed um, for many, many years. It's gone into the <laughs> um, But you've got, I mean, you carry on doing exciting projects. I know you're working on uh, Top Gun 2, you're working on Dune, which must be fantastic. And I hope, personally, that you work with Chris Van Nolan again on his new movie. Actually, I won't because you I'm won't. working on Dune. No, uh, it's, it's all right. He's got somebody really, 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 really good. But you've got—I mean, Dune must be because it's a, a sweeping kind yeah. of epic over two movies. Is that—is that strange going in for, for over two parts, or is it just one thing for you? I have no idea. I just loved the book. I never saw the other movie because I loved the book so much, you know. And Denis and I were talking—we've been talking about it for a long time. 
he said he's he's been wanting to make it for thirty years, and I said to him, I wanted to make it for forty years. So <laughs> you know, so 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 I don't know. You know, it's 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 like, um, yes, it's something I always wanted to do, and I think everybody gets it. And then this 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 weird thing, this touring thing that I wasn't going to do, I suddenly find it's actually really nice to look people in the eye and actually play this music and and be surrounded by, by these extraordinary musicians. you got James Earl Jones back for this. Was there any temptation to bring anyone else back from the original? Was it important to kind of, apart from that, to kind of detach yourself from, yeah, I from decide, what had gone before? I decided pretty early that, that it was uh, most appropriate to bring back one character and the character that isn't around for the whole story. And it is about the passing from one generation to the other of the mantle of responsibility. And so it, it, it made perfect sense to me to, to have it be James Earl Jones because he's, his voice isn't really replaceable. And, and, I, and I like the idea of announcing with our first uh, uh, casting announcement, James Earl Jones and Donald Glover. And I, I thought that that was a shorthand for the entire approach we would take on this production. Yeah, you get to work with John on this one, who is part of the extended Marvel family, the same as, same as you. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about Doctor Strange too. A lot of people were excited. Obviously, you left on a bit of a cliffhanger in the last one. Have they given you any indication of whether you're gonna be returned? Also, have they given you any indication of whether your character lived or survived the infamous Thanos snap? We are going to have to see, aren't we? <laughs> I love when I ask people that. They always say, yes. but if, if you were given the opportunity with that particular character, are you excited to see where it might go? Let's find out. Ah, Let's you see? <laughs> it's hard to penetrate. Oh, you touched upon Marvel. I'd be missed if I didn't ask you about the emotional ending of, of Endgame, which was hugely touching for so many people, and then carrying that into Spider-Man Far From Home, which has mm. been a, a huge success. So you... Are you, are you glad that the reaction to all of that has been so sincere and so, after all those years, that it's become such a... Sure, I mean, being there from the beginning when it was so precarious, uh, making the first Iron Man, uh, to the way they stuck the landing so effectively. And by the way, I would have never had the guts to do it the way the Russos did. I remember being there filming it and feeling like this is going to be really overwhelmingly sorrowful for the audience. But they handled it so well and so responsibly, and I think it really comes down to the performance of, of Robert and Gwyneth in those final moments that really made it feel uh, inspiring and not, not horrible, but 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 wonderful and sad, but uh, but what a wonderful summation to this decade-long journey, and then to have the opportunity to be there in the aftermath with, um, with uh, their on-screen daughter Morgan, and and also with, kind of his. I'd say spiritual son, Peter Parker, and to have Happy Hogan for me to be able to be there and participate in that. And and because I do care about those characters, they do feel real to me on some level, and it's wonderful to be there to help the audience through the transition to the next phase. So I'm happy I stayed involved there. Again, you, you know, how involved I was in the beginning where we're trying to break new ground and establish these characters, and what I am now is a supporting player and, you know, cheerleader for the franchise. It's a different role, but it still feels like there's a sense of continuity that I really appreciate. Absolutely. It's an absolutely fabulous talking to you. Thanks Great. so much for your time. Cheers. Pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!